mental knee replacement is a special subject because um, it How about, okay, how was that? Good? Oh, now we have, okay. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Great. Yes. Hi, my name is Gary Kroshar. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at Montefiore uh, Nyack Hospital. I've been in practice for 27 years. Um, I'm part of the team here that does uh, total knee replacements, total hip replacements, partial knee replacements, anterior hip replacements, robotic surgery, and I'm here to talk about one particular type of knee replacement, and that's called unicompartmental knee replacement. And I will explain what that means. Essentially, it's a partial knee replacement. Um, we do these routinely here at Nyack Hospital, and I thought you might like to know about where this special technique stands in its place among other type of surgeries that we perform here. One in five Americans will develop knee arthritis. And in fact, if you're in my office in Nanuet and you spent a day, you see many, many people coming through every day with arthritis of the knee. Arthritis really isn't preventable and it affects our daily lives. It affects our work. It affects our activities. And it's treatable at this moment, really not curable. Arthritis causes pain, loss of mobility, and it's progressive in nature. In other words, it tends to get worse over time. And it's one of the causes of our loss of function in life. So if as an orthopedic surgeon, I can help you to remain mobile, not have pain or have less pain and maintain your daily life and work and activities, then I'm doing my job. Normal knee anatomy involves two main bones, the femur, which is the upper bone, and the tibia, which is the lower bone. The femur on top meets the tibia on bottom in the joint space. And in the joint space, there are cartil there's cartilage. And there's two different types of cartilage. One is called the articular cartilage. And the articular cartilage is the surface of the bone. When grandma used to put the bone in the soup, that was the cartilage on the end of the bone that you saw. That was an example of articular cartilage. It's smooth, it's white, it glistens, it's rubbery, and it's really strong. You can walk on that, and it actually has a shock absorbing effect while you're walking on it. And it doesn't crack like bone. Instead, it's got a lot of elasticity to it. And it's very important that it maintains that bouncy quality to it. In between the tibia and the femur, are these two blue, in this case, meniscus cartilages. They're white and real in the real world. And these act as rubber cushions between the two bones. It's also made of cartilage, but it's a different type of cartilage. It's more like the cartilage that's in your nose or your ears. It's flexible. It's rubbery. It's moist. It's elastic. And it can tear. Many people in their 20s and 30s who come to my office have meniscus cartilage tears. And as we go through life, the meniscus cartilage, that's this blue cushion here, tends to get a little dried out. It tends to crack and it is more likely to tear. When a meniscus cartilage tears, it then damages the joint surface above and below. That's the tibia and the femur. 
This picture is a normal anatomy picture. There's a third bone involved as well, and that's the kneecap. So the kneecap right in the center, we call the patella. And that'll be important that you remember that name because I'm talking later about surgery for the patella if it's arthritic. In the middle of the knee, there's the ACL ligament, which goes right down the center of the knee behind the patella and the PCL, which you can't see really in this picture. And there are ligaments on the side that control the motion of the knee as well and give the knee stability. So a normal knee, such as in this picture, should have space between the two bones, between the femur and the tibia. And the space on the outside, this is the outside, and on the inside of the joint should be equal. If they're equal, that means that the cartilages that I described before have the same amount of thickness on both sides, the inner and the outer side. For our terminology, we use the word medial to mean the middle or center part of the knee. And we use the lateral to reflect the outer part of the knee. And then when we talk about in front of the knee, which I can't really show you in two dimensions, we call that patellofemoral, meaning where the patella or kneecap meets the thigh bone, that's the patellofemoral joint. So there's really three sections to the joint space, and we will talk a little more about them. Arthritis then is when that joint space is worn down. So a normal joint space, as I described before, should be equal on the inner and on the outer side of the joint. And yet osteoarthritis is the loss of that joint space. So this picture with osteoarthritis shows bone grinding on bone with no cartilage in between to form space. The caricature at the bottom of the page shows the same thing. Normal joint spaces compared to arthritic joint space. Now the arthritic joint space starts to develop some findings which are predictable over time. We start to get bone spurs on the edge of the bone. The cartilage gets lost on the surface of the bone. It gets scraped off almost if, as if you took a knife to it and dragged it across the surface. And the joint space becomes narrow. It's an erosion over time. The bone grinds on the bone. And when these two bones grind together, you get inflammation, swelling. It feels tight inside the joint. If it wears down enough, there's actually deformity, partly because the spurs cause widening of the joint space and partly because the bone starts tilting in one direction or another. And if tilting of the femur and the tibia against each other goes far enough, we can become bow-legged or knock-kneed and that deformity only worsens the arthritis in the joint, the pain, the difficulty with walking, problems with gait. And this is what it looks like when cartilage comes off of your bone. In the upper left corner of, this, of these four pictures is what cartilage should look like if I'm taking a picture of it. And when cartilage erodes or comes off the bone, then you can see raw bone underneath as shown with the green lines here. And there's a pointer showing raw bone in this bottom right picture. So raw bone grinding on raw bone, that's the problem with arthritis, that hurts. The cartilage on the surface of your bone is supposed to be this thick, as you can see from the picture. That's five, eight millimeters, about a quarter inch thick. So there are different patterns of arthritis. Arthritis doesn't have to happen throughout the entire knee. Arthritis can occur just on the inner or medial compartment. Arthritis can occur just in front in the patellofemoral compartment. Bone can grind on bone on the outer compartment. When it's all three compartments, we call it tricompartmental arthritis. And that's a complete arthritis pattern. But a partial arthritis pattern, and there is a partial arthritis pattern, pattern is when there's just for example, medial compartment arthritis. The caricature and the x-ray picture in the lower right of your screen shows just that. In the part that looks arthritic, there's bone grinding on bone. But on the left side of this knee, which is really the right side, but on the outside of the knee, 
there's good cartilage, good meniscus cartilage, good joint space. And that's reflected in the x-ray picture where the arrow shows bone grinding on bone on the inside of the knee and not on the outside of the knee. That happens a lot. And the reason why is there's more pressure on the inside of your knee than on the outside of your knee. So the inside of your knee is likely to wear down first before the outside of the knee. So how do you treat arthritis? Well, we try to talk people out of surgery if possible, but look at what we're up against. We're up against normal joint space versus bone grinding on bone. Let me go back one picture. Um, this is a series of pictures as the arthritis actually gets worse. We start with good joint space. It gets a little narrow. Bone is getting close to bone. It's just about touching bone. And now you've got spurs and bone grinding on bone. So what's the treatment? Most people try to live with it. Modify your activities. For example, if you run, you stop running. You do bicycle riding. If it hurts to walk long distances, you get a cane, maybe a walker, something to hold on to. When people come to me, I have only a few things I can offer. Pills such as Advil, Aleve, Motrin, Mobic, Meloxicam, Celebrex. These pills have temporary benefits sometimes, but they wear off. And as soon as they wear off, you're stuck with the same anatomy you had before. It still hurts. It's still arthritic. It's still bone grinding on bone. And pills have side effects. Not only do they have side effects, such as affecting your blood pressure or maybe your kidney, maybe your bleeding, but they also don't really do anything to treat the underlying problem and they wear off quickly. Injections. So there's different types of injections. The first injection that we use a lot of in the office is cortisone. Cortisone doesn't really cure any cartilage problems. Cortisone doesn't make you healthier. It just covers the pain for a while. And sometimes that's a valid treatment because people who have pain coverage can do rehabilitation, physical therapy with less pain. And some people just can't or won't go to surgery. So if I can do an injection and get you six months and do another injection and get you another six months, there's even a long lasting form of cortisone we use in our office that may last longer than six months. So cortisone is a valid starting point. But for example, people with diabetes can't take cortisone routinely. And there's only so many times you can go back to injecting cortisone before it's clearly no longer the effective proper treatment. So there's another type of injection called the gel injection, and it doesn't work the same as cortisone. As a matter of fact, it can be given alongside cortisone because it's a different medicine or a drug. Actually, they call it a device because it's really not even a drug. And so that's Synvis, Duralane, Gel One. There's probably 20 brands of gel injections in the knee. And we have them, we use them. And I have patients come back every six months for a repeat injection of these gel injections. And that's part of the treatment. Might help. Therapy. Therapy is good, really, not for the knee itself, but for the whole leg, for the whole patient. So if your gait is off, if your muscles are weak, if you're tight, if you need stretching, if you have balance issues, therapy is good for that. And part of the discomfort of arthritis comes from, we think, the whole patient, not just the knee. So therapy can be good for taking the problem and narrowing it down. Bracing. Bracing has its pros and cons. If I put a brace on your leg and it's too tight, it'll be uncomfortable. If I put it on your leg and it's too loose, it slides down the leg. And if it's on just right and you can go home and do the same thing, sometimes the side supports, I use a brace with brackets on it. Sometimes the side supports give some support and some help to a, a leg that's tilting inward or outward. And it, it can feel good when you wear it. I find that people don't comply with braces for long periods of time. So they must be uncomfortable. Maybe they're hot. Maybe people just don't like having a device on their leg. So non-operative care is good for dealing with the situation, but doesn't really address the underlying pathology, which is the grinding of bone on bone. So we could do some surgery, and there's really three types of surgeries that I have in my, in my quiver, in my armamentarium, in my list of things to do. 
this is an example of arthroscopic surgery. I can look at him with a camera, see the surface of the bone. In this particular case, the surgery is to make little holes in the bone, stimulate some growth, and possibly grow some temporary cartilage on the surface there. But it tends not to work for arthritis very well or very long. So arthroscopic surgery is generally considered useful for treating other things like ACL tears or meniscus tears. But for arthritis, it's really not the lasting treatment. Total knee replacement. I'll show you some total knees here. Total knee replacement is really the most common thing I do when it's time to replace something. And as a matter of fact, two hours ago, I was doing a total knee replacement. We do them routinely here at the hospital. We have an excellent team. We have excellent equipment. We have robotics. And that's what we routinely do here. So where's the place for a partial knee replacement? And that's the purpose of this talk. Why a partial knee replacement? What is a partial knee replacement? If you don't have one or you don't know somebody who has one, well, you will know something about it after I show you the next slide. Maybe the next slide. So a total knee replacement addresses arthritis throughout your knee. It's an excellent procedure. At 10 years, 10 years from now, 95% of the knee replacements I'm doing will still be in the patient if they're still walking. And those knee replacements tend to be very, very reliable. It takes the whole surface of arthritis and replaces it with metal, a special type of plastic that's very durable, and metal. It's kind of a sandwich between metal, plastic, and metal again. And we have all sorts of new techniques that are making these last longer. We think that the knee replacements we're putting into patients last easily 25 years in almost everybody and probably are a rest of your life procedure commonly performed. And it prevents the spread of arthritis because it takes the whole arthritic section of the knee, totally replaces it. So that's what a total knee replacement looks like. There's a couple of different devices I show you on this screen. There's a femur part, that's the upper part. There's plastic in between. There's metal on the bottom. That's the whole joint, except for the kneecap part. And there's a plastic piece that goes behind the kneecap that we put into place as well. This can be done with acrylic cement, or it can be done without cement these days. But basically, the components look the same. So this is the comparison. This is the crux of this talk. This is about partial versus total knee replacement. If you only have arthritis on the inside of your knee, is it valid? to replace only the inside part and leave the rest alone. What will happen? This is a comparison picture between a partial knee replacement and a total knee replacement. So you can see that the total knee replacement spans the joint surface from left to right entirely. And a partial knee replacement only partially covers the joint surface, the part that was arthritic. arthritic. That's assuming that only part of the knee was arthritic. A partial knee replacement is good because it's a smaller incision. It's a faster recovery, much faster. It's for isolated arthritis in only one spot. It can be performed as an ambulatory procedure. In other words, it's really common for me to do one of these and have a person go home the same day or the next morning at least. And now with our total knee replacements, I expect the patient that I did today to go home tomorrow as well. So it's a semi-ambulatory case, but these are commonly ambulatory. This picture shows on the bottom a person with arthritis only on the inner medial part of the knee. So a partial knee replacement was put in to create a space on the inner part. The surgeon did not replace the outer part of the knee or by the kneecap, and that's by design. That's by intent. This can be done under regional anesthesia. In other words, it doesn't have to be general. It can be a spinal anesthetic. So can a total knee. People return to golf and often tennis and biking and skiing with a partial knee replacement. So it has to be part of my things to do if a person has arthritis only on the inner part of the knee because they work so well when they're done in the right patient. This is a picture similar to the last, just showing you what the device really looks like. And that's what it is. There's an upper part, a middle piece of plastic and a smaller part. It's much smaller than a total knee replacement and it only covers the inner part of the bone in this case. 
This is a screen to show you what the robotic part of the knee replacement would look like. And this we use for total knees as well. What we do for robotic partial knee replacements is we get a CAT scan and the CT scan shows where the arthritis is on the inner part of the knee. And we actually tell the robot what size components we want, how we want them positioned, what angles they should be in at. And the robot gives us feedback and teaches us where to put these things. So we put them in exactly perfectly and they look great every time on the x-ray. There's another type of partial knee replacement that I'm really including for interest, but we don't really do very often. And that's called patellofemoral replacement. It's possible that behind your kneecap, you may have arthritis and not in the medial or the lateral part of the knee. And the underside, the inside of your kneecap, the patella can also be bone on bone. And that's what this x-ray is showing is literally bone catching on bone. It looks like puzzle pieces interdigitating, tapping on each other. And the bottom picture shows that in the normal knee, there's space behind your kneecap, but as the arthritis goes on, there's bone on bone. And that can hurt when you kneel or squat or do stairs. So is it possible to replace just that and not have to do a total knee? It is. And so what we do is we actually put a piece of metal into the bone on the femur and a piece of plastic. And so the kneecap goes from this to this look, and it can just be replaced with plastic and metal that way. And that's a design comparing the partial knee replacement of the kneecap with the total knee replacement, which is still the gold standard. So you need to know, of course, in all fair disclosure, that anytime I'm doing a knee replacement, part of the informed consent is that if we open up somebody's joint and we work in there for 45 minutes to 90 minutes, and we put in something metal and plastic that an infection can occur. Anytime we go through the skin, an infection can occur. And even after we've gone out of the skin and closed it up, infection can occur if bacteria goes through the blood, lands on the plastic or the metal. There's no immune system that goes through plastic and metal. Plastic and metal doesn't have a blood supply. So if a bacterium finds its way onto the surface, of a prosthesis, it can get infected. Luckily, the likelihood of infection is 1.5 to 2%, maybe less. And those infections usually occur because somebody has another health issue that predisposes them, such as being obese and diabetic. And we try to discourage obese diabetics from getting joint replacements unless they're willing to take that chance that they may get an infection. It's still less than 3%, but it's a real number that can happen. Loosening, you know, we have plastic and metal attached to bone. Of course it could get loose. The bone could be soft. People with osteoarthritis and osteo osteoporosis really with soft bones can have loosening. The joint can be stiff. The joint can be loose. When we put these in, we can put them in too tight or too loose, or we can put them in just right. And the patient can stretch out or the patient can stiffen up around the prosthesis, even though it was just right on the operating table. All of those things we contend with sometimes, but really the most common thing I see is incision healing issues. In other words, some people heal faster than others. If, for example, the picture there is not really an infection, but it's what we call stapleitis. There are staples in the skin and a person is irritated around their staples. It's common, so I'll call it an issue. Sometimes an incision can drain for a while because we give you blood thinners after the surgery, which causes some oozing, and we have to manage that. But it's usually very well managed and goes away. Blood clots are a concern. So after partial and total knee replacements, we give blood thinners depending on the patient's risk. What I mean is if a person has a high risk, such as a history of previous blood clots, you're going to get something stronger than just aspirin. But if you have a pretty clean history of not having risk for blood clots, we commonly give one or two baby aspirin a day until we see you walk in the office, at which point you don't need the aspirin anymore in most cases. Nerve injury, excessive bleeding are extremely rare in these procedures. There's really no big nerves and no big blood vessels in front of the knee. So the likelihood of those complications is really rare. So the benefits, the benefits of a partial knee replacement, I mentioned smaller incision, faster recovery, Really, you're usually off the walker in a week if you have a partial knee replacement. 
we preserved the ACL and the PCL ligaments with a partial knee replacement. But with a total knee replacement, we have to at least take one of those, the ACL ligament out. And the knee doesn't feel exactly the same in a total knee compared to a partial knee, which really feels more normal. It feels like your own knee because you keep the ACL ligament. And you can always revise to a total knee later, which is dreadful to think that one would go through a partial knee replacement and someday have to go to a total knee replacement. But those years with the partial knee replacement may be much more enjoyable than the total knee replacement, which as I said, is still a great procedure, but doesn't feel quite the same as a partial. And you can do more sports, more pivoting, more twisting, more activity with a partial than with a total. So what could possibly go wrong? What are the downsides of a partial knee replacement? Well, if the bone is really soft, as this picture shows, the bone can give way underneath the component. Sure, the metal is strong, the plastic strong, you can stomp on it all day long. But if a person comes down really hard on a partial knee replacement, it can tilt, especially in the tibia of the lower bone, which sometimes has a soft surface underneath it. And if it tilts, it can shift and then it's gotta be converted to a total knee replacement. The other thing that can happen, and you can see this also in this picture is the joint space on the other side of the joint is becoming bone on bone as well. Now there's a problem because one may feel really good where the partial was done, but the other side of the knee goes on to arthritis and further erosion will catch up. If it catches up, that needs to be a total knee replacement. So I need to take that out, clean up the whole knee and put in a total instead. How often does that happen? In my practice, once every two years, I might have to revise one. So it's rare and it might be somebody else's revision, but it's rare, it can happen. So that's the prepared part of the talk about partial knee replacements and a little comparison to total knee replacements. Um, I, I would like, like to address, address some questions if you have any. Yes, let me just make sure people are hearing me. And thank you, Dr. Koshar, for that uh, presentation. I enjoyed it a lot, especially like the pictures where it shows, um, you know, how it is done and all of that. That's very interesting. And we have a question here, actually. It is about glucosamine chondroitin. Like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Do you recommend that? Um, I used to do. My expression about glucosamine, and really with the gel injections, is it's either a zero or a plus. It's not a minus. And what I mean by that is it's not going to hurt you. It may not do much, but it's not going to hurt you. I don't know if it's a placebo effect or if people really have benefit from the glucosamine, but there was a, there was study, a study done about, about five, five years, years ago comparing people who took glucosamine chondroitin sulfate with like sugar pills and they had the same results. So a thousand people on each side of the study. So scientifically, it's not proven to help, but it's not harmful. My opinion is you probably digest it like you digest your last chicken or meal and it goes um it goes out with the meal but it's not harmful it was a nice thought i think that the injections, injections have more of a chance of helping helping because, because you don't, you don't digest, digest the injections, injections go right in your knee joint and when it goes in your knee joint and stays there it's more likely to have a lasting benefit without being digested by your stomach acids so i wouldn't advise you not to take glucosamine but i would be very suspicious of if the weather, weather really has a huge effect on the joint. Yeah, maybe more of a placebo effect for some people, you think? Well, I don't want to ruin it for people who were too cold. Look, if you feel like it helps you, it helps you, but okay. scientifically it's not proven. Yes. Now let's go back a little. What causes osteoarthritis? What causes the arthritis? Well, a lot of factors can cause the arthritis. Um, and there are and different, different categories, categories of arthritis. For, for example, example, a rheumatoid, rheumatoid patient, a rheumatoid person who has rheumatoid arthritis, that's a whole separate category because mostly I'm talking about osteoarthritis, but there's a whole group of people who have autoimmune disease like Lyme disease or psoriatic arthritis or uh, juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis or just plain old rheumatism. And so um, an and inflammatory process of, of rheumatism or rheumatic thing is really when you're immune to your own joint surface and your body attacks it like it wants to dissolve it. So that's a whole separate category. Another category of arthritis is traumatic arthritis. So let's say 
that when you were 23, you tore your ligament inside your knee, like your ACL, and the knee doesn't move normally anymore. Let's say that you were 30 and you got a motorcycle crash or broke your knee. You know, any trauma, any previous trauma to the joint can cause the knee to erode decades later. And that's really common, actually, that if a person had a previous injury, that it can go on to even a meniscus cartilage tear. And I'm seeing people who I did arthroscopic surgery on 15 years ago coming back with arthritis now because it was part of the cascade of eventual degrading of the knee that goes on with with uh, with natural biology. And then, you know, I like to think that we're very lucky to be living longer. Uh, the life expectancy when, you know, Einstein was around was not what we have. And the life expectancy even in 1960s was nowhere near what we have now. So people are living longer, but the warranty wears out earlier. So what I'm saying is when, think about when you were young, when you were six, and you thought about somebody who was 76 years old, 65 years old. We used to think of them as really old. We thought of gray haired old people who don't have much to live for. Now we got patients in their 90s playing pickleball. That doesn't mean cartilage was supposed to make the trip that long. So I think that the joint surface, especially in the knee joint, can only wear, can only be used so long before it starts wearing down. And, uh, you know, if they could only make a tire that lasts so long, it would be amazing. But the more you go down the road of life, the more you're going to wear down the surface. If you compound that by the fact that you may have some minor traumatic injuries, such as a small cartilage there inside your joint that acts like a marble in the engine and rips up the joint, there are things that can accelerate arthritis getting worse over time. So it is a many factor answer and everybody's individual. As a matter of fact, every knee is individual. So somebody look, looking at this talk might have arthritis in the right knee, but not the left or vice versa, because, because um, there, there could, could be a reason in that one knee why it had a microscopic injury that, that the owner didn't know about and it got worse. Mm -hmm. um, and we're getting questions now from our participants. How do people over 80 respond to these surgeries? So the oldest knee replacement I, I, I've, I've done, done in my practice is 94 years old. And um, she, she put it off because she had to take care of somebody else for a while and finally got around to taking care of herself. So um, I actually find that people who are between 80 and 85 are now becoming the, um, the a common patient and the, and the person this morning with 80. And the reason why is that's, that's the, now the new point where people are really starting to slow down. And if it's that point in their life where everything is, is well, except for the knee slowing them down, they get a better quality of life between 80 and 90 by, by getting, getting a new replacement, especially if it's gone on for a while and it's become really, really bad arthritis. The relief can be dramatic. It really can. So you can be an old 65 or a young 80. It depends on your physiology. It depends on your biology. It depends on your background health. And I certainly don't want to tempt your fate by offering a new replacement surgery to somebody who's got diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, more serious other health issues on uh, chemotherapy. We, we see all sorts of things that might increase the risk to a knee replacement. So we call it stratified risk. Yeah, sure, we factor age into it, but we stratify the risk based upon the whole patient, not just the age. And I've certainly had some 65-year-olds with previous history of infections in their body that I'd be very careful about operating on, and some super healthy 83-year-olds. So the answer is it depends. Yes. Do you feel the outcomes from surgery are better now with robotics? Yes, I do. I try not to be biased about it because, because I embraced robotics four years ago. I jumped on the bandwagon early. They say in, in our field, you shouldn't be the first or the last person to do a new procedure because if you're the first one, you're crazy. You're taking risks that nobody else does. And um, if you're the last one, it means you just got your head in the sand. You should have done it a long time ago. So I was next to the first person. I like to see a few, see how they go, and then jumped on board. And then I embraced it. And now I really, really believe that robotics is going to be used in other fields of medicine as well, such as dentistry and shoulder replacements are now embracing robotics. And I'll probably be using robotics for other types of surgical techniques. Robot doesn't do the surgery for us. Robot is a guide. Robot tells us when we're exact. And it makes us more exact than we were before. So my x-rays are looking better. My 
I think the fact that the x-rays like even better than my manual, my visual judgment is a good thing because we believe that when these components are lined up perfectly, it's kind of like your wheel being on the car being perfectly aligned and perfect alignment is good. It's good for, for the tracking of the knee, for the longevity of the knee joint. And I know that whenever somebody has a stiffness or an issue with the knee, I know it's not the way the joint went in because the joint went in perfectly. So it helps to narrow my problem list and it helps to make the knee replacements more predictable than they were before. We weren't all over the place with, you know, bad angulations and bad x-rays, but we're much better now than we were before. That's that's great to hear, I mean, especially the fact that we have it here at Naya. That's amazing. Well, we have two different types of robots and I'm proficient with both. Um, but the problem we had when we were embracing robotics was that it would add some time to the case or maybe even some length of the incision or some other risks. But um, just, just like, like a new technology, after you do your first time, you're kind of going to get the, get the rhythm. And so I'm way past that now. And um, the case is as fast or faster because um, because we really know how to use the robots well. So the, the good news is we're not going to be within the first hundred anymore. So we should, should really try. No, we're way down the learning curve. Now, to me, I don't do, I, I really do a knee replacement or a hip replacement without robotics now or without some sort of guidance because I, I think that if we have the technology, not only should we use it, we should, we should be really good at it. Yeah. The next question is, do patients have to be on immunosuppressant drugs post replacement similar to a transplant? No, not at all. No, as a matter of fact, we want your immune system working hard. We don't want anything that suppresses your immune system. If a person's on immunosuppressants, I would be very hesitant to put a joint replacement in them. Mm -hmm. And talking about wear and tear, going back to that topic, what about exercise? Some people say exercise is bad for your knees. Some people are like, no, you have to keep using them. What's your take on that? So I'm assuming the question means, does exercise actually cause arthritis and make your knee worse over time. Not a, This is not a question about whether you can exercise on a joint replacement and whether you wear out your joint replacement faster, although I could answer both. Um, the answer about exercise is it depends. Um, it depends on the type of exercise. For example, I think that if you were doing a lot of jumping and pivoting basketball, um, for example, a lot of pivoting and twisting and jumping, eventually, the knee's not going to like that. And so um, uh, I have colleagues who are in their mid and late 50s still playing basketball, but as you get towards your 60s and beyond, that kind of pivoting and jumping is really putting a lot of strain on the knee. I like, I like bicycling. bicycling, I like cycling. It's a really smooth exercise that keeps your, your body going without all that pounding and jumping. Running is the, or jogging is the in-between thing. Jogging certainly isn't basketball, but it's not bicycling. And so if a person goes to, for example, Rockland Lake and goes for a walk and sees a straightaway and want, wants to pick up a little jog and maybe even jog around the lake, compared to the amount of years that you've lived, does it add a little increment more of erosion? I don't know. It's unmeasurable. So I, I think, think that, that if you're exercising and it doesn't cause pain, probably okay. If you're exercising and you're a little sore, like on a scale from zero to 10, it's a three, it's probably okay. If you're exercising and you're feeling a five or more, like a pain scale of, of pain, you're feeling enough pain to change the way that you exercise or you're active, if it makes you limp, if it, if people can say, look at you and say, hey, how come you're, you look like you're in pain out there, that's a bad sign, you shouldn't be doing that. So you modify your exercise to stay in your comfort zone. But I think I think exercise, exercise is important for all of those other reasons, like your cardiopulmonary status, your heart, your lungs, your energy, your feeling about good about yourself. So it's a trade-off, but I think people should do as much exercise as they can tolerate safely. And as you say, we learn to accommodate and get used to the pain, but when is a good time to start considering surgery? So I, I um. It's a rare, rare case when somebody comes to me, gets an x-ray and goes right to a prosthetic joint replacement. There's risks involved and the mention of those risks. And we need to get to know you better before getting in that kind of relationship because I truly believe that the relationship between a surgeon and a patient, it, when we go into the operating room, is a permanent relationship and we need to be responsible for the outcomes. And if I operated on somebody who could have lived without it, shame on me for jumping ahead. So I try to take patients up the scale 
and um, and modify the. We do like this lecture. The conversation is about okay, how could you modify your life? Maybe get new shoes. Maybe not do uh, walking on the trails, but walking on paved surfaces like Rock and Lake or a track. So you modify your activities, and then maybe try some medicines, maybe some injections, maybe some therapy. I'm very into physical therapy because I think holistically it's very good for your body to know how to exercise properly and to have some discipline and then um, maybe a brace. So we try to go up the scale of treatments before getting to a knee replacement. But if you can't, if literally every time you try to get up out of bed and the first thing you dread is stepping on your leg, and this is true with hips as well, if you can't dress yourself properly or if you look at a staircase and you think about your painful knee every time, if you're trying to be with your family and you can't go somewhere because your knee is what's holding you up, if it's limiting your quality of life, and that's the main reason for limiting your life, we can do better. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who don't yet have knee issues, what are your recommendations to maintain our knee's health? I, I divide um, health maintenance from a sports, I'm a sports medicine fellow. In other words, I, after all my years of orthopedics, I graduated with sports medicine extra year, I took an extra year. And so I incorporate sports medicine in the rehabilitation advice even for seniors, seniors because, because I think the same concepts apply. If you really wanna maintain your joints, first of all, you have to listen to them. And if there is a pain, jump on it early instead of being the person who walked around for, for six, six months and then comes to me and I can't fix it. So, because, because if, if I, I can do something arthroscopically or microscopically or with limited intervention before getting to the knee replacement, that's much better. But, but I divide the rehabilitation or the exercise programs into stretching and strengthening. And so primarily stretching is really good for people because remember when we were kids, we look at an old person, we say, boy, they're really stiff. Stiffness accumulates over time. And so if you have a stretching routine, and that's I use therapy to teach you stretching, but if you have a stretching routine, it's great. I like yoga, I like Pilates, low impact type exercises, really good for senior knees. Um, and then there's strengthening. So strengthening might be a low impact thing like a half lunge or a partial lunge, um, maybe a half squat, body weight exercises, not putting too much pressure on it, but going through the motions of it. Um, again, yoga and, and uh, low impact exercises are good for, uh, for people. I work out in my, my gym um, because I like to use weights. But that's you know I'm in my fifties, so um, if you if you're comfortable doing a gym program, that's good. good. But the minimum is do some stretching and some focus strengthening, and don't skip that part of your body. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for these recommendations, and we're getting to the end of these presentations. So I want to thank you, Dr. Prashad, for a great presentation. We're getting some thank yous also from our participants, and. Please, if you have any questions, if you want to learn more about the robotics program and the orthopedics program at Montefiore Nyack, you can go to www.montefiorenyack.org. And I'm sure, you know, the phone number is on the screen as well. I'm sure somebody's going to reach out to you to let you know more about all these beautiful things that are happening here in Montefiore Nyack. So you don't have to cross the river anymore if you want new knees. You can do it right here. And next week, we're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease, and it's going to be the Parkinson's Wellness Project. And uh, well, I'll see you here next week. Thank you so much for accompanying us today. And thank you to you, Dr. Crochar, for doing all this for us and for our audience. Have a great time, everyone. Adios. Gracias.